It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, everybody, welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornstein. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs. And I am thrilled that you're tuning in today. We're continuing in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week, we made it all the way through verse 19 as we were looking at Paul's evidence for the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And with the resurrection of Jesus Christ would come the resurrection of the saints as well, that they were a package deal, that by Jesus Christ defeating death on the cross, resurrecting From that tomb three days later, that in this he would defeat death, the promises were sealed, and thereby promising and assuring that those who were in Jesus Christ, who believe in him, would likewise also defeat death, that we would have eternal life that would await us. And so he spent some time there at the beginning of the chapter, right through verse 19, really looking at what was going on at that particular time where people were questioning the resurrection. They were doubting even the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, perhaps, but more even they were doubting the fact that we as the saints would actually experience a resurrection, that just because Jesus would be resurrected didn't mean that we would be resurrected. And that's not what Paul refutes that uh, wholeheartedly, saying that that can't be one and not the other. It is a package deal that the Lord himself promised that he would do these things, that he would come again as he has prepared a place for us. He would come and take us unto himself, that we've spent now some time here covering that a great deal. If you miss those broadcasts, please go to calvaryfountain.com, and there you can pick up our archive of the sermon notes and all of the series that we've been going through here at 1 Corinthians. And as you know, as a verse-by-verse church, an expository church, this is where we spend a great deal of our time just examining the text, helping to understand it a little bit deeper by way of other contexts throughout Scripture so that we really can, can learn from this and be equipped as the saints for the work of ministry. So let's pick up again right here. Verse 19 is Paul is laying out the case for the resurrection and how exciting that is because of what it means for the promises fulfilled that we likewise will receive a new body unto a glorious resurrection and hope eternally, not just a hope maybe, but a hope assured. So this is a wonderful chapter in Scripture that uh, whenever you're feeling discouraged, you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, reread that, and you could put your eyes on the glorious hope that awaits. Here's what we read, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now, you can read a verse like that and completely misunderstand. What he's saying here is is the fact that if there isn't a resurrection, if Jesus Christ didn't even defeat death, and so our only hope was to be a better person in this life with absolute no assurance of another life, a new body to come, a glorious resurrection that awaits in a new body for eternity, as he has promised that he will do, then we're to be most pitied. Because that means that we were building our life on a lie. The, the foundation is is sand at best. This is not something that will stand the test of time. So Paul is refuting the argument that there wasn't a resurrection. Now we get into some real serious content to help us then reestablish our firm foundation in the faith, the knowledge and understanding that, yes, a glorious resurrection awaits us as well. It was a perspective of Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee that was recorded in Acts chapter 5 that if there was something that was built on a lie, there's no way it could sustain. But if it's of God, that it would endure, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And indeed, that's why we've seen the momentum of Christianity since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ over these 2,000 years as the church has grown and increased around the world because it's built on truth, not a lie. Here's what we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 38 to 39. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. 
He, he said this after Peter and the apostles with him preached with boldness. They were saying, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And you can also read about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So Paul has completed his entertaining, if anything, uh, entertaining this idea and refuting all of it that there, that there was no way of a resurrection. He has asked all of these very serious questions all through verse 19 of saying, well, if this didn't happen, then this didn't happen. If that didn't happen, then this couldn't have happened. And so he's trying to refute their logic, and now he's going to flip the page and point them to the glorious consequences of the fact that Christ has risen from the dead, and now what that means to us. There is, there is now a shift to some very positive and encouraging content here. So let's look at that. Number one here is that Christ's resurrection guarantees victory. That's what he's saying here in verses 20 to 28. The resurrection of Christ makes the resurrection of believers both necessary and inevitable. So those in Christ must arise since Christ also arose. So Christ's resurrection set in motion the defeat of all God's enemies, including death itself, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, and Hebrews 2, 14. So his resurrection demands our resurrection, since otherwise death would remain undefeated. So it's a promise of God to defeat death. Let's go to Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all of the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So in verses 20 to 22, this affirms the inclusive nature of Christ's resurrection. We've been folded into that resurrection reality. So this is something that Paul will spend a great deal of time on in 2 Corinthians. I would definitely encourage you to go back and read the whole book of 2 Corinthians. What an encouraging book in the scriptures. So now let's look. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he says here, but now. Now, that's those are two sweet words in the scripture, for they often are followed by words of comfort and hope, and such is the case here. Paul informs us that, that Christ has raised from the dead. A after all, Paul was a witness to that, according to Acts chapter 9. He spent three years with the Lord, just like the other disciples did who became the apostles. So Jesus is the first fruits of those believers who have died. Okay, so the imagery of first fruits, some, some people hear that term, think it's a Christianese term. That is a, a term that has been uh, laced throughout Scripture. And first fruits links to the feast of first fruits in the Old Testament. So on that day, at the beginning of the grain harvest, the Israelites brought the first sheaf that was harvested and dedicated it to the Lord. And that, what they believed by that act of obedience as God had instructed them, often assured the Israelites that the rest of the harvest would follow. You go to Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, and Leviticus 23, 9 to 14. So Jesus was crucified on Passover as the blood of the Lamb, which saved the people from death and gave them deliverance, as we see in Egypt, where it was originally demonstrated there by the power of God, only using the blood of an actual lamb. And here the imagery of the true blood of the lamb that was perfect since the blood of, of goats and lambs and oxen could not save us, and we needed the pure and undefiled blood of the holy Messiah. And indeed, he was crucified then on Passover to fulfill that imagery. And he was buried before the beginning of unleavened bread. And that, this, that was the, if you remember, the imagery even in the tabernacle of the bread that was there in the tabernacle and that imagery with the Lord and the unleavened bread was the purging of sin. And that bread would ultimately symbolize his body that was broken for us. And then he was raised on first fruits to make atonement for the people 
before God. And then there would be a fourth feast that would follow 50 days later after first fruits, according to Leviticus 23, 15 to 16, that was known as the Feast of Weeks. And it represented that the first fruits offering was going to bring a harvest. And indeed, the gift of the Holy Spirit brought a harvest of the church in fulfillment of the words of the prophets, including Hosea. So Christ was the first fruits, the wave sheaf offering, a male lamb without blemish unto God, exactly as scriptures had deemed it, according to Leviticus 23, 12. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. This is why Jesus told Mary Magdalene, In John chapter 20, verse 17, he says, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, the first person to be raised from the dead permanently. I mean, if you look at the other three resurrections that Jesus Christ did when he brought back Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, and and then we have uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, All of these, um, you know, were were, were individuals powerfully resurrected by Jesus Christ, uh, not including himself there in that particular equation. Uh, But, uh, of course, we see that in John chapter 21, verse 25, that there was so much recorded in Scripture, there wouldn't have been enough Uh, even outside of Scripture, to contain all of what Jesus had done. But uh, along with what was done with the five other recorded resurrections uh, that were performed through Elijah and Elisha and Peter and Paul, all of those individuals would, um, you know, we would see that every one of them would actually die again. So other than Jesus Christ himself, all of these individuals who were raised from the dead would ultimately die again in this flesh. So only one was raised immediately unto eternal life at that point, which was Jesus Christ. The others were raised miraculously, but they would go on to live a life and then die once again. So Jesus' resurrection assured that someday there was a complete harvest that was coming, not to die ever again but to defeat death once and for all. And we see that in Revelation 14, 14 to 16, and 19, 1 to 10. So after all, uh, Christ resurrected. Many dead saints came back to life and went throughout the city to testify to the risen Lord in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 53. So there were a number of amazing, miraculous signs of individuals coming back to life. And it was a testimony unto the power of Almighty God. But Jesus Christ, by his death, defeated death once and for all. 1 Corinthians 15, 21-22 then tells us, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So the point that Paul is making in these verses is Adam's sin brought death according to Romans 5, 12 to 21. And Jesus Christ's resurrection offers life to those who believe. So the word all here is used 12 times through verses 22 to 28. So consequently, some argue that all people will eventually be saved, and that's where universalism tends to come from. However, the all that will be made alive with Christ refers only to those who have fallen asleep in Jesus Christ. They have made that profession of faith. They have declared with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we see this even in John 14, 6. So this verb here, the Greek word, will be made alive, implies then a new creation. So moreover, then we look at what Paul is saying. He's only speaking about the Christian dead, not about a general resurrection that we read about in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, where those not in Christ will also be resurrected, but not resurrected unto life. They're resurrected to face the great white throne judgment. Jesus spoke of this in John 5, 28 to 29. He says, The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. 
So the imagery of first fruits implies that Christ's resurrection sets in motion a series of events that will culminate after his coming. So 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 24 says, but each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. So every Christian is going to receive a brand new body, but everyone must wait his or her turn. Christ was first. The key word here is the order, okay, tagma. That's a military term that refers to rank and order. And Paul was describing a military parade passing by. So with each corps falling into position at the proper time. So throughout history, different Christians fall into their place in the parade at their appointed times. So we see here verses 25 to 28. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So Paul is quoting Psalm 110.1 and Psalm 8.6 to support his arguments about the Messiah's reign here. So Psalm 110.1 is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. I don't know if you realize that. Psalm 110.1 is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. So the point that Paul is making is that God empowers Christ to accomplish all of his purposes. Christ is equal to the Father, but chooses of his own accord to submit to his Father so that he might receive glory. Hupot aso, that's a subject, that was a military term that describes the chain of command. So it's used of Jesus, if we look to Luke chapter 2, verse 51, to his earthly parents and 1 Corinthians 15, 28, to his heavenly father. So it's a universal truth, even for the church, that Christ modeled submission to the father in all things. And likewise, we are submissive as the church to Jesus Christ, who is the head of his church, according to Ephesians chapter 5. Also look to Hebrews 10, John 12, Hebrews 5, and Philippians 2 on that. So the Son and the Father are one, according to John 10, verse 30, yet separate. Therefore, the Son submits to the Father, and the Father elevates the Son, according to Hebrews 1. So this is the model for Christ and his church. So Paul has touched upon the victory that God and the believer will enjoy on account of the resurrection. Okay, He now moves on to affirm the motivating power of Christ's resurrection. So the next thing we look at here is that Christ's resurrection gives purpose. So Paul pins what could be the most confusing verse in the entire New Testament without proper context for it. You ready for this? 1 Corinthians 15, 29. He says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? <laughs> okay, now you can see why that's a very difficult verse to understand. Some scholars have su suggested that there are over 200 proposed interpretations to that verse. However, this figure is exaggerated. I don't know, perhaps. The actual number, I believe, is closer to around 40, which is still a lot. That means 40 different ways to interpret that particular text. So that's why we need much of the rest of the scripture to help us understand what he means by this. And you're happy to, to know that I'm not going to bog you down here with all the various interpretations. Yet I'll not be able to ignore the difficult verse that it is because it has been the subject of such controversy. I mean, Mormons, for example, have baptized millions upon millions of dead people by way of proxy. So all of this activity is based improperly on this one verse, and it flies directly in the face of scriptures that teach clearly that after death comes judgment, 
according to Hebrews 9.27. There's not a second chance if someone happens to be baptized for you. So therefore, I believe this verse deserves careful re-examination. And I take the view that when new believers in Corinth were baptized, they were credited their salvation. They ultimately, that's what they did. They credited their salvation to the gospel message that they heard or received from some of the apostles, many of whom who had already died. They did this because they wanted their uh, the, the deceased apostles to receive greater reward in eternity for the work that they had done. Basically, they were attributing the fact that they now understand the truth of Jesus Christ to someone who had already gone before them, who were faithful in communicating the truth, and they were then attributing the fact that because of their labors, we now see with clarity. We now hear with understanding, and our hearts have been changed. So that's what they were doing there. And so the Corinthians, they like to associate themselves with the ministry of cer- certain apostles, they did that right out of the gate. We looked at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, even 3 to 4. They really like to attach themselves with certain communicators of the truth. Now, some of the, the uh, Corinthian Christians there did not even believe in a resurrection, and, and their practice is contradicting their beliefs then. So Paul had previously mentioned eternal rewards in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 to 15, and the Corinthian desire to bring honor to the apostles in 1 Corinthians 1, 13 to 17, and how the Corinthians themselves would be part of Paul's apostolic reward when he would stand before Christ in 1 Corinthians 3 and 4. So if, if the Corinthians wanted the dead apostles to receive the reward that they were ascribing to them by baptizing new believers for these apostles, then ultimately they all had to come to the agreement that resurrection was necessary. So he's trying to examine their logic with them, that you can't have it one way and not the other. You can't be being baptized to attribute your salvation to the work of a now dead apostle if that apostle wasn't going to resurrect unto life with Jesus Christ. What difference would it make to attribute your salvation to somebody who was never going to taste resurrection if that wasn't part of the package deal that they were going to be resurrected as Christ was resurrected, as we all will be resurrected as Christians? This is the reverse engineering that Paul is taking them through. So the Corinthians were were being sort of uh, put in their place here by the Apostle Paul to help them understand some of the foolishness of their thinking and needing clarity on this very difficult subject. So it's important to understand that Paul nowhere uh, is, is denouncing the practice of baptizing with credit given to those who were dead. Okay, he's not saying that that is not an acceptable thing to do, to say, you know, you can't, uh, uh, you know, point the the praise to somebody who has gone before you because you're now being baptized. He's not saying that at all. It's possible that he was just trying to make the point based on their traditions. So both Jesus and Paul taught that credit is due to God alone. Okay, so they were really elevating men as the reason for their salvation. And what Paul is wanting them to do is just put all glory back to God where it belongs. That God is the one to be praised because he may have used whatever vessel who planted a seed and another watered it. And ultimately the harvest all belongs to God anyway. So there are some who are sent to sow. Others are sent to harvest. So man should not receive credit ultimately for what God's greater work is though the sower and the reaper will ultimately rejoice together. We are all going to celebrate when someone is walking the street of gold forever and ever, and nobody should be standing in the line to receive credit for that. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, let me just read this to you before we adjourn our time here today. It goes by so quick. Let's just be reminded. He says that Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. That's John chapter 4, verses 34 to 37. 
1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 8, then says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So again, the two verses there, I was kind of blending it to the other. Sorry about that. John chapter 4, 34 to 37, and 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 8, but both are the same subject matter that God has appointed for us to labor in his field. Some are planting, some are watering, and some are seeing the actual increase of the harvest and able to reap that harvest, but it's all the glory of God. It's all he who receives the glory for anything being done. So we really shouldn't be being baptized in the name of somebody else. We shouldn't be just crediting anything to somebody else. Really, it's all God used those vessels as a conduit of his mighty work. Again, we are just getting into this, but let me just encourage you with this. We will receive many crowns, many rewards for our faithfulness. We'll talk about that later in this study, but I believe this is why the elders will ultimately cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus in Revelation chapter 4 verse 10, because when we recognize what God has done through us, we dare not take any credit upon ourselves. That's what Paul's trying to get these Corinthians to understand. You, You are elevating man. Don't elevate man. Elevate God, who is doing the greater work amongst you. You want to be baptized? Be baptized in the name of the Lord. You want to confess salvation? Confess it to the name of the Lord. Any good work that's done in your presence, give it to the glory of God. It's all he who receives the praise. It's all for him, by him, and through him. And so these are the things he wants them to understand as they look to the resurrection and the evidence for the resurrection. I hope this broadcast has been encouraging to you. Again, we just got through a few more verses here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have so much more to cover in this powerful study, and I want you to to be encouraged. Tune in next week. We'll continue on in this vein of thought. If you're looking for a place to go and worship, check us out at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. We hope to see you there. God bless you, my friends.